First of all, you all negotiate all the time, and not just when you're buying and selling stuff. Negotiating is a lot more than just a business activity. It's very much a human activity. And the second point is that you can all do it better. Negotiating doesn't fit any of us naturally. And the payoff of improved negotiating skills isn't just to save money, although that is important, but the real benefit of improved negotiating skills is that it will make your life better. All right, so I'm going to launch the poll. We'd like to get 100% participation on this if we can. So here goes the first poll. And um, so you get to choose in your personal interactions with people, are you a giver, a taker, or a matcher? All right, and it looks like we've got participation now of about 30%. So we'll give it a little longer, uh, 52%, 66, a little more. 70. We'd like to try and get at least 80%. So if you haven't voted yet, please join and vote in the poll. 79. Good. All right. So that looks pretty good. So I'm going to end the voting now and then we'll share the results with all of you so you can see how the voting came out. So here are the results here. We have 34% are givers, 4% are takers, and 48% are matchers. All right, Frank. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I just, mm, I've had somebody who went to one of my programs who, who tried to describe the three styles this way. He says, well, when you're eating out with friends and the server brings the bill, um, givers are the people who reach for the check and, and say, uh, I'll, I'll get it this time. Uh, but they do that every time. Um, matchers immediately whip out their calculators and start divvying up how much each person owes down to the penny. And takers... Well, as soon as they see the waiter heading to the table with a the bill, they excuse themselves for the rest of the restroom and come back 20 minutes later. Um, you know, that, that's a little bit of a misinterpretation, I think, of, of what Grant means by this. Uh, and, and you can see that we had a very small percentage. Nobody wants, or very few people want to identify themselves as takers. This is not a, um, um, a kind of a, a moral story here, a question on, about people's morality. Um, what, it really, what he really is saying, when he mean, what he means by mat, uh, takers, is not that they're greedy SOBs who are just out for themselves, who won't spare a dime for anybody else. They may, be, they may be extremely charitable, they may be wonderful people, but it's just the way they see the world, that the world is a kind of a cruel place, and if you don't take, take care of yourself first, uh, nobody else is going to do it. So, um, and, and givers will just have a, a different attitude towards it, which is that, look, if I help somebody else out, I'm liable to get some kind of uh, uh, um, help in return at some point. So in any case, um, let's see. So um, the, the other thing is that I, I wonder if the results would have been a little different if I posed another question first that, that Grant did raise. And the question is, what is the, the most and the least successful approach in terms of professional advancement? Now, let's define what's meant by successful. Uh, for example, for engineers, it would include the overall quality and effectiveness of their work. For salespeople, the main criteria is, of course, closing deals and ultimately making and even exceeding sales targets, quotas. So we're, we're going to put this, we'll start with the poll in kind of negative terms. Which is the least successful reciprocating style? Okay, so we're going to launch our second poll now. We're going to ask you that question, which is, which is the least successful uh, reciprocating style, giving, taking, or matching? And you can all vote now. And once again, we'd love to get about 80% participation. So uh, all you have to do is click on the screen. And we got about 30, 40%, 50%. 60, give it a little longer. The least successful, 32%, 76% participating. If we can get a little more, that would be great. Last time we stopped about this number, can, if anybody else wants to vote, we give it a second more. We're at 79%. If you're still figuring it out. Okay, yeah, we got another person joining. That's good. Okay. All right, well, so we will end the voting now, and uh, I will share these results. 
So Frank, 27% said giving, 47% said taking, and 11% said matching was the least successful reciprocating style. All right, <laughs> what's, the, what's the actual answer? I'm, I'm sure you're just dying to know. And um, I, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna let the suspense go a little bit longer because we're gonna see a real to life negotiating scenario and then you can decide. So Jim, you wanna describe the setup to the scenario. Absolutely, we're gonna watch a little skit that we shot here at Mobus Creative Negotiating. Um, and this is two people negotiating over a advertising brochure which would be put into trade magazines. So the buyer wants to get a, a million four color brochures placed in trade magazines and the seller, who's a young lady, is offering him 25 cents a brochure. Uh, I'm gonna kill the camera while we watch this video. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. so you're ordering a million of these four color brochures. Yeah. They're four pages each, considering the size of your order. It's worked out a really good deal for you, 25 cents a piece. That makes the total order 250000 <laughs> Whoa. Okay, don't worry. We could do something a little better. Well, I hope so because your competitors have given me a lot better price. So um, you're going to have to sharpen your pencil, bring that price down uh, five, no, 10%, make the total order two and a quarter. Mm, I can't do that much. But okay, how does 235 sound? You're getting closer, but you're not close enough. Well, what about 230 Come on, I, I need more. Okay, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get your business and keep you happy, but I'm kind of at my bottom line here. I mean, well, what if I have an idea that could benefit us both? I just want to ask you some questions about your business first. Why don't you worry about your business and I'll worry about mine. As far as you're concerned, I need another 5K. Can you give me that or not? Sylvie, tell the other guys to be right with them. Take it away. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we need a big poll to see who was the giver and who was the taker here, or who was the winner and who was the loser for that matter. Uh, it's pretty obvious that the seller was the giver slash loser and the buyer was the taker slash winner. And this is what Grant found in his research. In terms of professional job performance, let's see, where, okay, here's, here we go. Here's what Grant found. Quote, the givers were the least productive and effective engineers measured by the number of tasks, the technical reports, and drawings completed, in addition to errors made, deadlines missed, and money wasted. In one study among a large group of salespeople, givers brought in two and a half less uh, uh, sales revenue than matchers and takers. He noted that they were so concerned about what was best for their customers that they weren't willing to sell aggressively. Now, among professionals, professionals generally, and again, this is all quoting from Dr. Adam Grant, compared with takers, on average, quote, givers earn 14% less money, they have twice the risk of being victims of crime, and are judged 22% less powerful and dominant. Uh, so for those of you who identify yourself as Mother Teresa, bleeding heart do-gooders, who devote half your lives to charitable activity, you, you may want to rethink that approach. Apparently, you've been paying a really steep price for all your good works. Now, the key word there is apparently, so don't get too upset quite yet. Um, and so let, let's just, though, first of all, relate this back to negotiation, because you're going to see there's a big qualifier and a, a sort of a reversal. But in, in this situation that we just saw in the video, where Jim was negotiating with the, the young lady, um, he, as the buyer, put the seller on the defensive right off the bat with that um, kind of monster in the closet or competitor in the lobby. And so she buckled pretty quickly on her price. And you saw what happened. She, left, she ended up leaving a good chunk of change on the table. Now that leads to this question, which is really the question of the, of the program. We said, are you a giver or a taker? And then the, 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 the other part of it is, how do you get your fair share in a negotiation? So how do you get your fair share? There's a, a number of rules, some of which we talked about last time or we touched on last time, and I want to reiterate them. First of all, you've got to protect your confidential information. For the seller, starting off the negotiation by saying, I can do a little better on my price, probably not her best move. The, the point is, the overall point is that when it comes to talking about what's motivating you in the negotiation, especially how badly you may want the deal, the rule is to shut up. Don't reveal anything about your vulnerabilities. <clears throat> now, another rule 
and we mentioned it again last time, but I want to bring it up again, is don't concede first if you can help it. If you start off with a nice juicy concession, it suggests there might be a lot more coming. And that ties into another one. Keep the concession small. When you make a large jump, especially with your first concession, it signals that you might be desperate. And I start figuring, if I hold out, I'll find out really how bad you want this deal. Now, we could keep going, but I think you get the point. The rules go something like this. First of all, again, don't share any more information than you have to. Secondly, don't concede first. Three, don't make large concessions. Now that's just scratching the surface. It's not even the, the start of, of what are the, the comprehensive rules to get a better deal for yourself and to get a fair share. Um, but they're really under the general heading of being a giver is a losing strategy in negotiation. Why? Because your mental model gets in your way, where you're so concerned with looking out for the other guy that it prevents you from following the rules of successful negotiating and taking care of yourself. Now, this leads to the next poll, um, which is what's the most successful uh, reciprocation strategy? Uh, Jim? Great. All right. So we're going to launch our third poll now. And uh, as Frank said, the question is, uh, which is the most successful reciprocating style? So if you would all vote now, uh, you're giving, taking, or matching. What's the most successful? Giving, taking, or matching? Uh, we have about 37 percent participation, 42 percent, 53, 57, all right, give it a little more time. Love to have at least 80 percent participation in the voting, so please uh, join in. Oh good, that's our 80 percent. Give it a second more, that was very fast. All right, that's fine, so we're going to end the voting and we will share the results. So here's our outcome. We have 6% think that giving is the most successful, 20% think that taking is, and then 62% believe that matching is the most successful, Frank. Yeah, so I would say um, that 6% of you have read Adam Grant's book because say, well, if giving is the least successful, then obviously the most successful must be taking or matching. But as he noted, um, this is not the case. Um, the most successful ones in terms of professional development are the givers again. Um, so this is what was really fascinating about his, uh, about his research. While engineers with the lowest productivity are givers, the, one with, the ones with the highest productivity are also givers. Top salespeople are givers, averaging over 50% more revenue than takers and matchers. Grant concluded that across occupations, quote, givers dominate the top and the bottom of the success ladder which means that there are winning givers and losing givers. Or, or to be less judgmental, there are more successful and less successful giving strategies. Now that leads to an obvious and important question. What do the successful givers do that the unsuccessful ones don't? Now there's a, a one word difference between the two and it's a word called negotiation. Now wait a minute, I thought we just went through some rules of negotiating that show how negotiating is really a taker's game. Well. It is, sometimes. But that's only one way to negotiate. Bargaining, price haggling, which is where most negotiations begin, but they don't necessarily have to end with that. Now let's return to our scenario with Jim negotiating with the young lady and wind the clock back a bit before the seller started cutting her price and, and see if the negotiation could have gone a little differently. All right, so like I said, your competitors are a lot lower than you, so you got to sharpen your pencil. You're going to come off that price 10%. I'm sorry, I want to work with you, but I just can't cut my prices. I mean, especially not $25,000. I mean, I gave you a good price right off the bat. Well, it might be a good price for you. For me, you're way high. Okay, I hear you, but you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Maybe I can come up with something that would help you reduce your cost, but help me at the same time. All right, I got my ear. What do you have in mind? Well, what exactly do you do with these brochures? I mean, do you hand them out at trade shows? Do you use them as mass mailing pieces? No, no, it's a little different than that. We use them as an advertising piece in the trade journal, so we have them inserted right into the journal with a perforated edge so people can tear them out. Okay, all right, that's interesting. Um, well, how many of these trade journals do you advertise in? About a baker's dozen. Yeah, and are they all assembled in the same place? No, no, no. They're assembled at 12 different locations all across the country. 
Yeah, well, I see that we ship all your brochures in bulk to your central warehouse in Dallas, mm -hmm. and then what? You reship them from your warehouse to different locations? Yep. And who pays the freight, you or them? We do. Hmm, any idea what that costs you? Yeah, I handle the shipping, and it ain't cheap. It's nearly 50 grand. That much? Wow. Well, do you know what kind of discounts you get from your carriers? Well, we're not that big a shipper. We only get about 30% off their established rate. 30%, that's it. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, um... Well, actually, maybe this is an idea that could help you out. Why don't... Why don't we do the shipping for you? How would that work? Well, we could, um, you know, ship directly to the 12 locations on what we call prepay and add basis. That means we pay for the shipping now and then we bill you later. I don't understand. What's that do for us? Well, we're one of the biggest shippers in the country, so our discount rate is double what you get from your carriers. That means if you do the shipping through us, you'd effectively get our discount rate, cut your shipping costs in half, and that'd save you, what, 25 grand? Oh. Yeah, okay folks, so who is the winner here? If the buyer's goal is to win a $25,000 price concession, which he's able to get by the seller coming up with his innovative shipping arrangement, then the buyer is the big winner in this situation. What about the seller? If instead of offering a, a large price concession, she's able to get the order at her quoted price by coming up with this huge cost-saving idea, well, I'd say she's also a big winner. So this was a ta textbook win-win outcome. Now, how did they do it? Instead of either of them conceding right away, they stood their ground and got creative with a certain outlook. That before we have an exchange over price, we first of all need to exchange information, work the discovery process. So the difference between losing and winning givers then is what? The losing givers just give in, period. Where the winner, um, the, the, the givers rather that are winners, give in differently. They give in in the spirit of give and take. The difference between the seller in the first scenario and how she handled it in the, the second go around. So let, let's talk about this concept of giving and taking and matching uh, uh, in the context of the, what I'm gonna call the rules of negotiating. And the reason I put the, the word rules in quotes is that I don't believe that there are too many rules that apply to negotiating writ large. What actually happens is there are different sets of rules that apply to different types of negotiation. And rules that work well in one mode are completely counterproductive in another. For example, in basic bargaining, if one side or both are trying to gain at the other's expense, the negotiation looks very much like a, a win-lose contest. But what this little skill, skit illustrates is that negotiating is not just a single activity. As we pointed out last time, Negotiating is really made up of a continuum of activities. It starts with basic bargaining, then has the potential uh, to move into creative deal making, and finally can move into strategic relationship building. So there is not one style that fits all. Uh, Grant points out that in the mix of their business and personal lives, people tend to adopt different styles of how they reciprocate based on the situation. So that in the home, especially in dealing with their kids, people tend to be selfless givers. When helping people at the office, we tend to be matchers. For example, I'll help them out with their project as long as they do the same when I need their help. And if they don't, well, <laughs> I'll be damned if I'm gonna help them the next time. And with external suppliers and clients, in other words, with people who are negotiating with outside our organization, we tend to be takers, grabbing as much value uh, as we can. Now, what I'd add, and I think it is consistent with Grant's outlook, is that you may lean towards the taking side when you're bargaining, but to find out the kind of information that's needed to make a, a more creative deal when you're actually adding value, like the, um, what did we call it, the prepay and add in, the, in that shipping um, uh, uh, trade-off that the lady made, you gotta come across as a more cooperative and collaborative counterparty, where the goal is, I wanna help the other guy out. In other words, in this case, Jim's got a problem, how can I help him solve it? So you're leaning much more heavily in the direction of being a giver, but not completely. As you add value, you still wanna make sure you're getting your fair share. So it's more of a matching strategy. Again, this is in the creative deal-making, that, that part in the middle. And then as you get into a longer-term relationship, 
This is where you can move into a pure giver strategy. Now, if we can agree that negotiating is not just this single activity, but is a process that moves through these different stages, you can think of it kind of like it's, it's sort of like moving around the table, where in bargaining you're on opposite sides of the table, and the general approach is what I gain will come at your expense, and what you gain is going to come at my expense. So it does tend to be adversarial, and despite the fact that people have different reciprocation styles, the outlook again, in other words, the, the way of conducting yourself is, is a lot more on the taking side. In deal making, you and, they, you and the other side are on the same side of the table, but you're still concerned about getting your fair share. So there's this kind of a mix of cooperation and competition. Now, now there's an important warning here. When you're working together to find these mutual gain synergies, like we just saw in our, our skit, because the negotiation has become less adversarial, where you're working together, it can be somewhat disarming. In other words, what I mean is that there's this tendency to assume the positive, that I can now trust this person to share these rewards equally. But that's not always the case. You know, if Jim were a real go-for-broke taker, he could say, look, I want all the benefits of that cost savings in, in the shipping area and still try to get a lower price, which is why I said that you may have to continue bargaining, even when you get into this creative deal making, to make sure that you get your fair share. And finally, in relationship building, you're dealing with a negotiating partner where the rules of the game have changed in a radical way. Instead of looking for how to get more out of them, you're looking for how you can do more for them to deepen the relationship. But again, you do have to make sure they've got the same outlook regarding you or the whole thing just ain't gonna work. I mean, <clears throat> you'll put up with it for a while and then you probably wanna break off at the other side. So the main difference between what I would call the passive givers, in other words, the givers who often get taken, and the, the negotiating givers is that the, the proactive givers, the ones who are more successful, do not just assume trust. They recognize that, to, that uh, to make sure that to get their fair share, trust has to be negotiated. Otherwise, you just can't move across the continuum. Or, or you can move across, but you're not going to get your fair share. And regarding the, again, the so-called rules of negotiating, not only does each mode have its own rules, but as I said, the rules are somewhat contradictory. In bargaining, we said that the less information you share, the better, the better off you are. But if you just stick with that tactic of shutting up, it becomes almost impossible to find a more creative deal. So you want to alter your tactics as you move along the continuum. But that means you've got to see both the deal and the negotiating process in a broader way. Um, for, for example, to make the kind of deal this lady made, requires a negotiating tool that people routinely shortcut, which is in-depth discovery. Now, everyone acknowledges that probing, discovery, is important, but the question is, how do you do it? Now, if you just pepper the other person with questions like your, your Perry Mason browbeating a witness on the stand, they're probably going to clam up. Um, so in order to get people to open up, you have to take a real interest in what they need to get out of the deal like we saw the seller do in our little skit, where she was expressing a, a deep interest in what Jim needed that went beyond price. This is what Daniel Goldman, Goldman is a top sociologist, anthropologist, I believe, uh, what he, Goldman calls empathic concern, which is a giving approach. You're giving the other person your attention. More than that, you're sharing your interest in them. Now, th there's another question I do want to bring up that people raise with me all the time when I start talking about this business of giving, t giving and taking in my seminars. The question is this, as a society, are we moving more in a giving direction or more in a taking direction? Um, let's poll our audience and see what you folks think. Yeah, Jim. All right, so this is our fourth poll. It's a very simple one. All you have to answer is, in the United States, are we moving more in the direction of giving or of taking? So you can vote now. Um, we got about 28% participation, 42, 46. Once again, so we'd love to get to 80%, so give it a little longer. And we're at about 64%. People are puzzling over this one. 
67. Give you a little longer. 71. Just one more second, we've only got 70% participating. Those of you that have voted before, if you take a second to vote now. All right, and let's uh, end. That's with 70% roughly. We'll share the results. Looks like our, uh, our group here thinks that 28% are uh, that in the United States we're moving towards giving and 56% think we're moving towards taking. Uh, okay. Um... I'm going to ask you to participate in something else, and we, we haven't done this before. We've always done these kind of multiple choice polls, and, and so I don't know if this is going to work, but um, this is a write-in poll. Um, examples, so if you pick that we're moving in more in a giving direction, what are some examples of that? And if you pick uh, in a taking direction, if you can write in some examples of that. And again, I, I have no idea if this is going to fetch us anything, but let's just take a, a minute or two and people can type in fast and if not full. Good, okay, so I'm gonna launch that poll now. And you should be able on your screen to type in your answer, examples of how people, how we become more like givers or takers in the US. So type in an example you think of people becoming more like givers or people becoming more like takers. Coming in. All right, about 22% of you have uh, shared something, so we'll give it a little longer. Twenty-seven. Okay, we'll give it maybe another 60 seconds here for people to wade in. That's about 30% of you. Good. 30 seconds more. Anybody got any more ideas? 37%. All right. So uh, that's about almost 40% of you. All right, so now let's, um, I'm going to share these results here and um, I'm going to show the details. Okay, so here uh, from, uh, here's one, um, how we become more, okay, here's one. Uh, look at Bernie Sanders, all the lovely, lovers of him think they'll get all kinds of stuff for doing less. Uh, let's see, and then holding to pricing and upselling, those are people that are takers. Um, this is, uh, let's see, we find another one here. Um, social welfare being considered a right, that's a sort of a taker. And then, um, yeah, and then foreign aid, imperialism. <laughs> All right, we'll try one more here. Let's see if we've got one more. Okay, crowdfunding and a way of doing givers, moving towards offshore for cheaper labor rate is sort of a taking strategy in the global marketplace. And um, uh, then making a case either way. All right, so there you go. Yeah, I, um, I, I sort of agree more with the, the last person that the, well, in, in any case, that, the, um, that the, the answer is, are we moving towards being uh, a society where we're more like givers or more like takers? The answer is yes. Um, I, I think they're going in, in sort of both directions. So um, on the side of, of whether we're heading more toward the giving side a, a society, we do have this example from... Um, from uh, Dan Pink, and he's a um, he's a leading behavioral economist or in that school who has studied human motivation um, most prominently in his book Drive, and uh, he gave a, a TED talk and it, it was posted on YouTube, so it's uh, you're able to, we're able to download that, and I'm going to show a very very short clip of this. Go back in time a little bit. Imagine I imagine this if I went to my first economics professor, a woman named Mary Alice Shulman. And I went to her in 1983 and said, 
Professor Shulman, can I talk to you after class for a moment? Yeah. Just, I got this inkling. I got this idea for a business model. I just want to run it past you. Here's how it would work. You get a bunch of people around the world who are doing highly skilled work, but they're willing to do it for free and volunteer their time, 20, sometimes 30 hours a week. Okay, she's looking at you somewhat skeptically there. Oh, but I'm, but I'm not done. And then what they create, they give it away rather than sell it. This is going to be huge. <laughs> I mean, she, would have, she truly would have thought I was insane. Okay, it seemed to fly in the face of so many things. But what do you have? You have Linux powering one out of four corporate servers in Fortune 500 companies, Apache powering uh, more than the majority of web servers, uh, Wikipedia. What's going on? Why are, why are people doing this? Why are, they, why are these people, many of whom are technically sophisticated, highly skilled people who have jobs, okay? They have jobs. They're working at jobs for pay, doing challenging, doing sophisticated techno technological work. And yet, during their limited discretionary time, they do equally, if not more, technically sophisticated work, not for their employer, but for someone else for free. That's a strange economic behavior. Economists who look into it, why are they doing this? It's overwhelmingly clear. Challenge and mastery, along with making a contribution. That's it. OK. Um, yeah, it's, um, it, Pink goes on to say something I, I found really interesting. And, and he relates it to the way our, because obviously he's saying, look, there's a lot more of a kind of a giving outlook. Um, and, and he relates it to the way the economy has changed, that as we move more into a service economy, it's quite different from a manufactured economy in a lot of ways. And one of the differences is that, um, that service organizations have to be much more what he calls purpose driven. And whenever you have a disconnect between the the profit motive, where the profit motive, motive is overwhelming, um, the sense of purpose that people have, you get lots of problems. And so companies are moving more in this direction. Now, that's one tendency. Um, there, on the other side of the question, we, we, uh, we do have this example. Which is um, our political leaders in Washington. Um, don't seem to have taken this to, uh, to heart, um, that um, not only is it not filled with a bunch of givers, but uh, who are eager to find win-win compromises with people across the aisle. Um, and I don't think we need a poll on voting on that one. So um, what it really says is that we're kind of going in two directions. On the one hand, there is a lot more of this um, this kind of giving spirit, especially in, in business, and you see with partnerships and people establishing companies trying to establish more long-term relationships with their vendors um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, there is certainly a lot less what's called comity, not comedy, but comity, which is uh, friendship um, in, in the political sphere. In fact, Tom Friedman uh, of the New York Times talks about the different ways that collaboration is used that in, uh, in Silicon Valley, collaboration is a great positive, whereas in Washington, D.C., collaboration is looked at as being a, a traitor to your side. So um, in any event, this is, this is sort of one of the, the phenomena that's going on that I think we have to think about. Now, there's one other uh, uh, issue I want to raise, one final issue, and then we're going to open uh, the discussion to questions. And, um, uh, and, and I think we do have a number of questions that have been coming in. And since I've been um, uh, talking about uh, giving and taking, um, <clears throat> uh, in, um, in business, um, the question has been brought up to me many times, which is um, uh, the question, the way it's put to me is, um, are we, um, let me think about this. Um, Yeah, if I'm a, I just lost my train of thought for a second. Okay, here it is. If I'm a passive giver, this is the question. If I'm a passive giver, how do I transition to a giver who stands up for myself? Or as Graham puts it, how do I go from being a, a chump to a champ? And this is an, a, an especially important question for managers of negotiators, which is how do I make sure that the people negotiating on the front lines, um, on my department's behalf or on my, my, my company's behalf, 
uh, how do I make sure they're not giving away the store? And this is not an easy thing, and it's not one simple magic bullet, but here is one idea to start. Um, to put the issue in terms we talked about in our last webinar, the, the question really is, how do you change your mental model? I, I mentioned in that program, in other words, in the first webinar we did a few weeks ago, that there's someone I started working with on this topic, and his name is Bill Anton. Now, Bill is a clinical psychologist. In fact, he headed the department at the University of uh, South Florida, and for many years, he's coached CEOs in, in leadership. Now, one of Bill's recent books is titled Business Success Through Self-Knowledge. And I think that title gives the answer, or, or at least the, the first step in transitioning from a, a passive giver to a successful giver. And it starts with self-awareness. You do have to ask yourself, why do I shy away from negotiating, from standing up for myself? And I, I think the answer is that it has to do with your self-image, this, this mental model of how you see yourself. You know, very few people consciously say, even to themselves, well, I'm a giver. Um, Adam Grant created this category of givers and takers, and the reason it's a, it's a breakthrough idea, really a genius idea, is that he's created a context so that we can understand this dynamic better, and with greater understanding we can then affect change. Um, what many people have that um, he would call givers, and uh, what they do say about themselves, is um, that I help people out, and the public perception of me is that I'm generous. Um, or something along those lines. I don't overstep my bounds. I'm not out for myself. Well, okay, so that's their mental model. Then it comes time to negotiate, where you do have to be assertive by asking for a lot and not giving in immediately. And people find that very difficult to do because they say, hey, look, that's not me. I don't want people thinking of me as piggy. And I actually once had somebody confess to me that I'd rather pay a higher price than have to negotiate. It's like the story I told last time about that graphic designer in New York City that, uh, you know, she'd rather just accept the printer's price and have him be disappointed in her because she asked for a discount. Her rationale was, I've been fair to him, so he'll be fair to me. It's almost as if she felt like if she asked for too much, it would violate her, her own self-image as a giver and she'd have to think of herself as a taker, which is not the space she wants to, to be. So there, there's a couple points I want to make on this score. First of all, People get trapped by the assumption that, look, here's the fair price, and I don't want to be unfair and ask for a better deal than that. It'd be like cheating the other person out of what's fair. What I want to bring out is this, that when buying in a complex market, you really don't know what the fair price is. You make an assumption you know what it is, but there's a built-in flaw in your assumption that often works against you. And take this negotiation that Jim went through with his printer. Now, she was asking 250000 Jim, i got to ask you. How much did you hope to get it for? And then what's the most you would have paid to get the deal? Well, what I was trying to do was get the price down $10,000, get it to like $240,000, but when push came to shove, I would have paid the two fifty dollars because I had a lower quote from a flaky vendor, so I really had to go with her. Um, all right, so Jim, the, um, what I'd say is that Jim the taker would want to keep, I think you got to turn the camera. Um, Jim the taker would want to keep, oh I see, would want to keep the price, uh, keep driving that price down as low as possible, even pushing the seller, if they're desperate enough, into selling at a loss. You know, who cares about what, about being fair? I'm about to get as much as I can for myself. Now Jim the giver has a different mental model. He doesn't want to be unfair, so he defines fairness as what price? The price he's hoping to get, that 240. And the tendency is to feel like anything below that Geez, I'm really being unfair to the poor seller. But what's he overlooking? He doesn't know the seller's motivation to get the deal. She may have designated his company as a strategic account, and a price of 230 would be just fine with her. The, the point is that the fair price is highly subjective, and the game of negotiation is to test the marketplace out. Now, that's not being piggy. That's just way, the way the game should be played. Now, every marketplace is different, and I'm not saying there's always some huge range, but in complex markets, there's usually a pretty good size range. I mean, if you're buying weed on the Chicago Merck, the Mercantile Exchange, and it's $8.12 a, a bushel, uh, you're probably going to pay $8.12. But if you're buying something else, keep in mind that range is probably bigger than you think. That alone will allow you to be more assertive when you negotiate without violating your self-image as a giver. 
Now, there's a lot more to overcoming the reluctance than just keeping in mind that the market range may well be larger than you assume. But that, I believe, is the most important first step. And now, um, why don't we open the discussion to a few questions?